All right, good morning, everyone. Um, if you guys would open your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And um, it's been quite a few weeks since we've been in the book of Thessalonians with the holidays and everybody traveling. We traveled a little bit and missed a little bit. So it's, um, it's good to be back into the new year and getting back into the book of Thessalonians for one whole week because we're going to be gone again next week to the conference. So, but um, I'm really excited to get the last chapter of Thessalonians. It's been a um, very edifying book to be able to teach through and being able to um, study through. So if you go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll read from verse 1. It says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are children of light, and the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath appointed us, hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I, I like how he starts off chapter 5 because, you know, what we've always said is, is that just because there's a chapter and a verse number doesn't mean that the thought, the context has changed. But what we do see is he's going to contrast the things that he ended chapter 4 with and he's going to talk about something new in chapter 5. Because the first word is what? But. So now he's going to contrast what he previously had taught us there. And the but here is going to be, he's going to contrast the catching away with the day of the Lord. And we're going to see that here in chapter 5. So the former section that we read through dealt with the body of Christ, the new revelation that was given to us. And we talked about God's twofold purpose as we went through that passage, that God has a plan for the earth through his nation Israel, and God has a plan for us as the members of the body of Christ in heaven. And so we said that this, what was taught here in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 18, is dealing with us as the body of Christ specifically, to where chapter 5, we're going to see, see it's going to be talking about God's program with the nation of Israel. And um, there's three familiar prophetic terms that's used in this verse. Look what he said of these verses here. He's going to note, we need to note the term times and seasons. We need to note that the day of the Lord, and we need to note thief in the night. And these are all prophetic terms we're going to see, and we're going to look at some verses about that. And, um, but look at verse 1. He says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I what? Write unto you. Why? Because it's already been prophesied about. They've already known it. You have to also, we have to also remember as we approach this passage, were there Jews in this church? Yes. Were there Jews in the region? Yes. So would they understand and know the times and the seasons and understand some things about that? They naturally would. And so he says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Go with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We're going to see that term here used again. In Acts chapter 1. And look at verse 6. It says, When they therefore, Acts chapter 1, verse 6, And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to who? So what is the topic? The kingdom being restored to Israel. And then he says, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, and then he gives explanation, which the Father hath put, where? In his own power. The context has to do with the time period before and during Christ coming to earth to restore the kingdom to Israel. See that? So the times and the seasons, if you, go, if you look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Number one, it's important to note and think about this, that the times and seasons concern Israel and their kingdom, not the church, the body of Christ. Has absolutely so if we don't we say I don't fully understand these times and seasons of Israel at the end of the day guess what 
it doesn't fully matter because it doesn't pertain directly to us. Number two is, and something to note, is that they've already been given a lengthy discussion on the topic of what's taking place in the times and seasons. We went through it already together as well in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 goes into lengthy detail about this topic. But there's some verses I want to look at over the times and seasons. The nation is already used to this. The nation of Israel is already used to this. Go back with me to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. And look at verse 12. It says, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not, what? Theirs. And shall serve them, and they shall afflict them, how long? For 400 years. Is that a time and season? Yeah, and look where it started. Abram at this point isn't even called what? Abraham. But he says something's going to happen, and what's going to happen is, is for 400 years they're going to be basically slaves. Where? In the land of Egypt. Did that come to pass? It sure did. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. And by the way, that 400 years wasn't 400 years of all these things going well for them and going great for them, right? Jeremiah chapter 25, in verse 11, it says, And this whole land shall be a what? Desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for how long? 70 years. So we see another time they're going to be in bondage and slavery for how long? For 70 years. Go with me to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. We see another thing here mentioned. He says in Daniel chapter 9, in verse 24, it says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the what? The most holy. So there's some good things that's going to take place at the end of that. Was there good things, if you look at it, when the nation of Israel was taken into bondage for 400 years, when they went down into Egypt, there wasn't that many of them. But when after those 400 years they come out of Egypt, was there a lot of them? Yes, and then God says that he's going to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Did he do that? And he did by a mighty hand. He brings them out of the land of Egypt and brings them unto their own land. At the end of, Babylon, at the end of this, this punishment here of what was determined on the nation of Israel, what was supposed to happen? Well, at the end of it, it was supposed to be, there were 69 weeks that had been accomplished. Daniel's 70th week is what we refer to as the tribulation period. That hasn't taken place yet. But that was what was supposed to take place, but was put on halt because of what happened. They rejected the Father. They called for the crucifixion of the Son. And then they stoned Stephen, which was rejection of the Holy Ghost. Immediately, God's program then ceased with the nation of Israel. And then what happened? God formed this agency, which we now refer to as the body of Christ. And so when we're reading of the times and the seasons, it's going to refer back to what it's talking about here in the book of Daniel. And that's what Paul's going to further discuss. Go back with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 1 says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. And then verse 2 says, For yourselves know what? Perfectly. That term, know perfectly, that's the only time it's used in the Bible. It's interesting. I like that term, though, because he says you guys have a genuine understanding. You fully you, you understand what's taking place. He says, For yourselves know perfectly 
that the day of the Lord so cometh as what? A thief in the night. So the topic, the day of the Lord, it involves a time of persecution, it involves a time of trouble, it involves a time of chastisement for the nation of Israel and the entire earth. When you look at it, the whole earth is going to suffer. And, and, and then at the end of what we see there, for the things that's taking place during the tribulation period, what we see is, is a return of Jesus Christ himself physically to the earth. And we already covered before that when the Lord comes and we're caught up to be with him, does he actually physically come to the earth? No, we're caught up in the what? Clouds to meet the Lord in the air. But at the end of tribulation, does he physically come to the earth? He sure does. Why? Because he's coming to establish his kingdom. And so he's coming to establish the throne that was promised to David, by the way, as well. And there's a lot of good verses. I put some verses up there. We're not going to read, don't worry, we're not going to read through all those verses because we don't have time. But those are, these are all really, really good verses to look at pertaining to the day of the Lord and the things that's going to take place during that time period. If you go with me, though, we'll go and look. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 30. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 30. There's a lot of things that it covers the topic of the day of the Lord, and it can be a, a lengthy, very, very lengthy study on itself. But I'm going to spend, I think what I want to do, I'm going to give a general synopsis kind of of the day of the Lord. But what I want to do is, is when I go to 2 Thessalonians, we're going to actually spend more time on that topic because there's a lot of things in 2 Thessalonians that where he says it's interesting that they know perfectly in 1 Thessalonians 5, there's some trouble that's caused in the church in 2 Thessalonians that it doesn't seem that necessarily they know perfectly the distinction between what takes place for the body of Christ and what's taking place for the nation of Israel. So, but if you look at Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7, it says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of what? Jacob's trouble. So a day doesn't necessarily mean a 24-hour period, right? It's also a time. But he shall be saved out of it, for it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall be no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Verse 10. And it says, Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in what? Rest. And be quiet, and none shall make him afraid, for I am what? Man, what wonderful promises, by the way, when you read that. It says, For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whether I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether. What? So is there punishment? Yes. But at the end of that punishment is a reward. Well, God's going to fulfill his promise to his people is what he's going to do. If you go with me to the book of Zephaniah, oh, where is that at? You guys would be so ashamed that there is kids at our summer camp that can find that book. But how do they do it? By luck and by speed tabs. <laughs> Lots of speed tabs. You see these kids, they come, they don't have speed tabs. Halfway through the week, guess what they have? They've got speed tabs in their Bible. I say, well, what are those? Well, so I can find it faster. They don't have a phone, so at least they're using a Bible. Zephaniah chapter 1. You guys should all know where that is, by the way. Can't believe it. Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is what? At hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice, he hath bid his guest. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. In the same day also will I punish all those that leap on the threshold which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that there shall be the noise of a cry from the fish gate and a howling from the second and a great crashing from the hills. 
How the inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down, all they that bear silver are what? Cut off. And it shall come to pass at that time and I, that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees and say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore their goods shall become a booty and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses but not inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards but not drink the wine thereof. And then verse 14 the great day of the Lord is what? Near. It is near and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is what? A day of what? Wrath. Paul tells us that we are what? Saved from the wrath to come. But what is that day? A day of wrath. Are we going to live through the tribulation period? No. Why? Because that day is what? A day of wrath. And he says, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. You know, when I think about that, I'm the type of person when it's cloudy outside and rainy, I'm not very motivated to do much. You know, and when it's like that, you just feel down. You don't want to, you know, they've done studies on that too. You know, places that it's like that you, uh, for most of the year, the people that live in those cities are usually depressed and aren't motivated to do things. And that's why everybody wants to move to Florida. It's because it's sunny and it's nice and people get motivated to do things, right? But when you, look, you think about all these things that are taking place, distress, trouble, wasteness, desolation, we think we live in a bad time now. But then you start reading what's going to take place during this time period and you're like, Man, am I glad I don't have to live through that. And he says, in verse 16, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I, verse 17, and I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to what? I like that because everybody thinks that if they have money and wealth, it can get them out of all their problems in life. But in the day of the Lord, in the day of wrath, it's not going to help. And he says, he says, neither shall their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. We should praise God. We are not going to be there for that. Because I don't want to be a part of that day. And so Paul, when he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you go back there with me, and if you go to the book of Joel and Isaiah, and there's so many other passages, Ezekiel, and you read through those passages, it's like, whoa, all the details, the descriptions, the t what's taking place during that time, it, it's, it's not a good time. And so he says here in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, he says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a what? A thief in the night. We're going to discuss that in the next verse. If you go to verse 3, he says, For when they shall say, peace and safety. Isn't that something everybody wants? Yeah, people want peace. They want safety. They want a place they feel secure. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not, what? Escape. There is not an escape there. You know, I, I was thinking about this verse this week. We're starting to plan already. I can't believe it. It's already time to start planning for the summer camp. And um, there's a verse. If you go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And um, verse 13. He says here, he says, There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man... But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to what? Escape. So there's a way, there's an end to it. But here, there's no what? According to that, you're not escaping it. It's interesting to think about that. So he says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety and sudden destruction shall com cometh upon them and travail upon a woman with a child, they shall not escape. 
You know, the, Paul uses the analogy of a, a thief in the night. And it's used to depict unexpectedness. If you're asleep in your home at night, you know, I have nightmares about people breaking into my home. I've never had someone break into my home. But sometimes you're, you're asleep at night. Is a thief going to come and start banging around and making a bunch of noise and break out all this stuff? Or is the thief going to try to come in and slowly get his way in? He's going to sneak his way in. He's going to take what he wants and he's going to leave. It's a sudden thing. And so it's unexpected. You don't expect someone to really, you know, people always say that when something really bad happens to them. I never expected that to happen to me. You know? When Israel thinks that they have secured peace and safety, and by the way, they think they've secured peace and safety by virtue of a covenant that was engineered by the Antichrist, destruction is going to come upon them and travail. The word travail means a writhing in pain. It was a, a totally different experience in my life when I watched my wife give birth. I've never thought someone could sustain so much pain, you know, because the people told us they thought she was going to have the baby really quick, everything was progressing, going well, and then she was in labor. She was in labor for like over 24 hours at that point, by the time we actually had the baby. And so to watch, to watch something like that, and then the Bible uses that as a description so we can understand it's not going to be easy. And by the way, they don't, at the end of this, a lot of people don't get that joy at the end. Now, the nation of Israel, the believing remnant, is going to have tremendous joy at the end of that. But the unbelievers are not. They're going to go suffer through that, and then they're going to go to the lake of fire for eternity. Think about that. You suffer through tribulation and then the lake of fire. And so... So we see, we see that the, the word travails used. It's used, by the way, over and over again in the Old Testament prophets. And um, Isaiah chapter 66. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 66. I know this is, a, this is a more meaty topic this morning, I guess you would say. But I think it's really important for us to understand what's taking place and the things that he's talking about there. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 1. It says, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that he built unto me, and where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine, mine hand had made, and all those things that have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. He that killeth an ox is as if he has slew a man, he that sacrificeth a lamb as if he had cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he have offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he have blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth where? In their abominations. Do we see that today, by the way? People don't change. You see that back then, you see the prophecy of it. And in the future, people are going to do that. He says, I, will all, he says, I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them because when I called, none did answer when I spake. They did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. Verse 5, Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed. A voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies. Before she, what? Travailed. She brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to birth, to the birth, and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God? Rejoice ye with Jerusalem, and be glad with her, all ye that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all that ye mourn for her. That he may suck and be satisfied with the breast of her consolations, and that Ye may milk out and be delighted in the abundance of her glory. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her 
like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then shall ye suck, ye shall be born upon her sides, and be dandled upon her knees, as one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and ye shall be comforted where? In Jerusalem. And so what do we see? We see Israel's rebellion, we see a promise of a Messiah, and we see Israel having a time of travailing, but God will cause her to bring forth the believing remnant, and there's going to one day be peace and rejoicing, and the end, meet, and end goal of that will be a kingdom established for them, which God had already promised to David. That's what's, take, that's what's going to take place. That's the wonderful promise that's going to take place for the nation of Israel. Now, can we rejoice in the fact that God's going to do that for his people, Israel? Yes, but do I take away their promises? No, because I have promises that are in heaven. Their promises are here on the earth. And so if you go back with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and by the way, I don't think that the day of the Lord is just when he comes back to the earth at the end of tribulation. Part of that is going to be during the tribulation period. I'm going to, I'll discuss that further in 2 Thessalonians. But, and I think we've discussed that a little bit in, in detail as we were discussing some of the other things here in 1 Thessalonians. But, and, and so when he says here in, in verse 3, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3, he says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Something to think about, the word day in the Bible, and we, mentioned, we touched on it before, does not always refer to a literal 24-hour period. We have to look at the context of what's taking place. And so the day of the Lord is not a 24-hour period. The day of Christ, which we've distinguished, is different from the day of the Lord. It overlaps in some areas, but it's not the same thing. The day of Christ deals with us as the body of Christ. The day of the Lord deals with the nation of Israel, which was promised about. Is the day of Christ one day? No, I don't think it is. It covers a period of time. And so, if you go to sec, but if you, so Jeremiah chapter 30, go with me. We're going to look at just three verses about that. Jeremiah chapter 30, go with me to Jeremiah chapter 30. We read this verse earlier. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. It says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And then look what the, it doesn't stop. It continues on. It says, It is even the what? Time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. See that? So a day and time are referred to as the same. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. verse 1 and 2, 2 Corinthians 6, and verse 1 and 2, he says, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that he receive not the grace of God in vain, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time, what? Accepted. And in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is what? The day of salvation. Would you say that time and day is interchangeable in that verse? You'd have to because it's, it's using both in that verse. And so it's not referring to a specific, all right, for 24 hours it's going to be the day of salvation. It's a time period that we see there. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. It's the last one. And there's a lot of other verses you can go to, but I thought it would be nice to show one. You got one in the Old Testament, you've got one in Paul's epistles, and you've got one in the future books, right? Hebrews chapter 3, but it's referring back to a, a historical account here. In verse um, 7 and 8, it says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, where? In the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works, how long? Forty years. So that day there is referred to how long? 
40 years. So it's just interesting to think about when we read that term day, it's not necessarily always going to be a 24-hour period. But now, sometimes if it does say a day, it does mean a day. So just as we do with the rest of our Bible studies, we need to always take the Bible in proper context. Read it in its context. Study it in its context. The day of the Lord is the time which the Lord Jesus Christ is going to unleash judgment, and it's a time that he's going to establish peace and a kingdom on earth. If we're going to sum up the day of the Lord. There's a lot of details in there that we're not talking about, but if we're going to sum it up, that would be the summing it up. If you go back with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I like what he does here now. So the ver- chapter 5 started with the word but. And he contrasted what took place, what he mentioned before, and what's different between Israel. Now look what he does. In verse 3 and 4, he says, when they, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. What's the next word? But. So he's given us a description of what's taking place for Israel. Now guess what he's going to do? He's now going to contrast it back what does that information mean to me? How does that apply to me? I like to know when I read something and study something, how's that going to affect me? How's it going to help me accomplish something? And so he says, but ye brethren are not in what? Darkness. That, should, that, that day should overtake you as a what? Thief. You see that? So what is that time period he just referred to it as? He just called that darkness. You see that? During that time, it's not a time of light. Because he's going to contrast it in the next verse. In verse 5, he says, Ye are all the what? Children of light. You see that? As members of the body of Christ, and this time period of grace, and this day of grace, we are waiting to be caught up with the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. In verse 15, he says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be what? caught up. That's important to note, isn't it? Well, where? Caught up together with them, the ones that were dead in Christ that's been raised, to meet the Lord where? In the air. And so shall we ever be with who? The Lord. So the Lord never physically comes back. We're caught up where? With them, the dead in Christ that's died. We meet the Lord in the air. And then where are we going to be? Heaven. Then what's taking place? The tribulation period on earth. But where are we? In heaven. Why? Because we're saved from the wrath to come. Because we're not in darkness. Because we're the children of light. He isn't going to leave the children of light to live in darkness. He isn't going to pour his wrath out on the Lord Jesus Christ again. We have to think of how important that is when we think about this. Are we members of the body of Christ? Are we members of his flesh and of his bones? So as a member of the body of Christ, has God already poured the wrath out upon the Son? Yes. When did he do that? At the cross. So if the Father's already poured out the wrath upon the Son at the cross, we have been identified as ones of the members of the body of Christ. If we live through tribulation, would God then be pouring his wrath out again on the Son? He sure would be. That's why we're not going to be here. That's why we cannot be here because it would be going against, God would be a liar if that would happen. And we know that God cannot what? He cannot lie. So we won't be here for that. After we're gone, you know, there's a lot of people that teach that there's a, there's a small time period before tribulation. Very well could be. I don't know how long it is. It could be. But we're, ultimately, it doesn't matter what's taking place here. That's how I look at it, because we're going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, 
it's a lot. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 15, the other passage that he talks about that in. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse 51, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall, all, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up, where? In victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is what? The law. What was nailed to the cross? Sin and what? The law. What had, who gave us the victory over death? The Lord Jesus Christ when he rose from the grave. And then he says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I like how he concludes the thought of the, remember what he's talked about in 1 Corinthians 15. The, our hope fully relies on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Without that, we have no hope. He concludes that in Adam all die, and Christ are all made alive. We're gonna, our vile bodies, our wretched bodies are going to be changed and made incorruptible. And then look what he says in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye what? You know why he's instructing them to do that? Because there was a lot of people in this church that wasn't steadfast. There's going to be a lot of adversity in our lives, just like in their lives. So he's going to encourage them, be ye what? Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. What that means is whatever we do in our lives, we can abound in the work of the Lord in. As a father, as a mother, as a son, as a daughter, as a friend, we can be abounding in the work of the Lord in all those aspects. And then he says, as you know that your labor is not in vain, where? In the Lord. The motivation to continue on is, is knowing that our labor, our work, is not in vain in the Lord. Now, this is a lot different than that day that this is the day of wrath. This is a day we're rejoicing to see. This is the day that our hope relies on. If you go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and you think about that, what is the book of Thessalonians about? It's a book of hope. He contrasts our hope, our blessed hope, our catching away with the fact of the nation of Israel and their sufferings of what they're going to have to go through. You see that? Because that brings us hope that we don't have to live through that. And when we say hope, it's confidence. We have a surety. We're fully persuaded in that. Am I going to live through tribulation? I'm sure not. That's why he says, look what he says in verse 4 again. He says, but ye, brethren, are not in what? Darkness. That that day should overtake you as a thief. What day is he referring to? The day of the Lord. That's what he's referring to there. That day is not going to overtake us. The word overtake means to take eagerly, to seize, to possess. The day of the Lord will not overtake us as a thief because Christ, who is our life, is going to deliver us from that. That brings joy. That brings hope. You know, we live in a world that is joyless. We live in a world that's without peace. We live in a world that's without hope. But the Word of God brings us all of those things. And the world we live in, the reality of the world we live in, is, is not going to get and turn into a better place. It's going to get worse and worse. But that's why it's our job to realize, you know what, we're not in the darkness. We're in the light. We're in the sun. Go with me to second, or Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. So 
Starting in verse 1 with me, he says, But ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named amongst you as become a saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather, what should we be doing? Giving of thanks. The world does the opposite of that, by the way. He says, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon who? The children of disobedience. Then he says in verse 7, Be not ye therefore partakers, where? With them. So why is he saying that? He's telling us that the things that the world does, the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon the children of disobedience. They're in darkness. Why are we going to participate with that then? And then he concludes, he brings this up. He says, for, further explanation here, he says, for ye were sometimes what? Darkness. We were that. He says, but now are ye what? Light and the Lord walk as who? Children of light. We are light in the Lord. We are the children of light. So is God going to leave us who are light in the Lord and the children of light to live through darkness? Not that darkness. But is the world still dark today? It sure is. And so what he, he tells us there is we shouldn't, and that's what he's going to start bringing up. If you go back to First Thessalonians 5, what he's going to start doing is, is he's going to take the things of talking about that, the wrath of God, how it's going to be poured out, the day of the Lord, how it's a time of darkness, and, and, and he's going to talk about, guess what, guys? We aren't going to be there for that, but we need to wake up and live as the children of light. Walk as the children of light. Live out the identity that God has given us. Look what he says. He says, In verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that 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 day should overtake you as a thief. We don't have to live in fear of that. We can live in confidence that we're not going to live in that. Then he says in verse 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of what? Darkness. Same thing he's telling the Ephesians, by the way, in chapter 5, Ephesians 5. He says in verse 6, Therefore let us not, what? Sleep. As do what? others. But let us watch and be sober, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night, but let us who are of the day be sober. And then look what he says, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to what? See what he did? He talked about our catching away our hope showed the nation of Israel in the day of wrath and the times and the seasons and the travail they're going to go through. And then he reminds us in verse 9, for God hath not appointed us to what? Wrath. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together where? With him. You see how chapter 4 verse 18 is in the conclusion of that thought? We have to take it in context. The things that we learned in chapter 4 have carried over to chapter 5. And what's that theme? We have comfort, we have hope. The conclusion of the book is also going to be we have comfort, we have hope. And by the way, the one that called us is faithful. Look at that. In chapter 5, verse 24, he says, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will what? Do it. You see that connection? Everything gets connected back to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our blessed hope, our Savior, our God. And I like what he says in verse 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves, how? Together. And edify one another, even as also ye do. You see that? You guys are doing it. Continue in that. Keep going on with the work. Getting on with the work. Are we going to live through the day of the Lord? Strict question. Yes, but I'm going to be in heaven, right? No, we aren't going to be a part of that. 
we're saved from that wrath. Amen? Let's give thanks. Father, thank you for us being able to study your word and being able to come here together to be able to learn about you and to grow together and to edify one another. Thank you for the life that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and the hope of his coming and that it could be at any moment, today, tomorrow, 10 years from now. But as long as we're here, may we stand fast in the faith and share this word with others that they may also be saved and have the, the hope that we have in a world that's full of hopelessness. Thank you for the life we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and the love that's been displayed to us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.